Welcome, I'm Mike, a Googler, a statistician, and I'm passionate about learning and sharing. Today, I'm a friend and I welcome you into my office. This is an exciting day. I have paused and set up a new series and today is the day we're gonna embark on it. This is an end-to-end -end workflow just like the others, but we're gonna focus in on training ML models using a particular framework. And today we are gonna start this journey of custom modeling using TensorFlow. What is TensorFlow? It's an ecosystem, a platform. It's a solution for ML where at the center you can build ML model architectures and let example data come through and train against like a loss function that's trying to be minimized with different objectives. And in the end, you get a trained model that you can export. Uh, what's also amazing about TensorFlow is that outside that ecosystem, the ability to get to any type of data anywhere is made possible by things like TensorFlow IO, which we're gonna use today. On the back end, how you take that model and make it usable, uh, whether it's embedding it in an app with something like TensorFlow JS or uh, just saving the model and putting it in an endpoint and calling it like an API and sending new examples, uh, it gives you an incredible ability to do that in, in a very easy way. So today we're going to kind of strip it down to I'm inside of a notebook and I want to train a TensorFlow model. So I have TensorFlow locally installed and I'm going to bring in data with TensorFlow IO and train a model. And in the end, we're going to take that save model, use it locally, but then move it over to Vertex AI and Google Cloud and let it serve new predictions online. Um, that means we're using the same data we've used in the previous examples, a BigQuery data set that is fraud. Uh, it has this one column that tells us this transaction on a credit card is fraudulent and the, or not fraudulent. We have many more not fraudulent records than we have fraud. In the previous videos, we've used AutoML from Google Cloud uh, Vertex AI. We have also used BigQuery ML and we've trained with uh, a logistic regression. Uh, I'll keep it a secret until we get there, but I'm gonna make the world's simplest architecture for ML in this case, just to illustrate that, you know, you can choose whatever architecture you want, but getting data in and models out, that's gonna be the key to what we show today. So with that, we may as well jump in. I'm gonna pretend like I'm you, I'm a user. I've ended up at the GitHub page that's, located, that's uh, linked down in the description, and we're gonna chase it from there and work our way through. So let me share my screen. All right, we're on the GitHub page. We've landed here. Today we're gonna look at this 05 notebook where it starts, but how would I know about the 05? Well, maybe you've watched the intro video and you've worked through this, or you've come to this chart. And let's enlarge that. Let's see, Command Plus. When I look across this flowchart, it's the current contents of the repository as far as uh, ML training notebooks go here. Uh, we've worked our way through the O2 series and the O3 series, AutoML and BigQuery ML. And now we're gonna go into our first foray of uh, custom training. We're gonna use TensorFlow for this. Now subsequent series, we're gonna look at uh, scikit-learn, we're gonna look at uh, uh, things like uh, PyTorch, R, uh, and other frameworks that are very, very popular. But I wanted to start with the central one, TensorFlow. And a number of ways to do this. So I'm gonna start how I would start as a user, just tinkering with data and kind of setting up an architecture before I commit to a lot of compute resources that might be expensive. Uh, I'm gonna just take a notebook, start it up, and directly in the notebook, train a model. Uh, so what that means is TensorFlow. Okay, we're gonna have a notebook VM. Now we've already discussed how to get a notebook uh, instance and we're gonna open that same one up here. If you haven't done that, back in the earlier intro video, it tells you about using the OO video to set up an environment and the O1 to set up the data source. Uh, once that all that work is done inside the VM, we are gonna export our model out into a Vertex AI model and use it as an endpoint to serve uh, new predictions. So jumping back out of that zoom in, let's take a look at where we're going to go next. Uh, you can, if you want to just follow along with the video, click the notebook directly in the repository and follow along. Uh, if you're replicating my work at the same time, that means you've already set up an environment in Google Cloud. So let's open that up.
Now, once I'm in Google Cloud, I'm gonna to navigate to my notebook instance, which is in Vertex AI. First thing I do is make sure I'm in the right project. Uh, turns out this has defaulted to a project I was working on earlier today. So I do need to change that. But let's get over to Vert or oops, change that. I'm gonna scroll down here, pick StatMic Demo 3. That is where we have been doing all of the work for this video series. And then under the main menu, I'm going to pick Vertex. Now Vertex AI, as we know, is a set of core services to make machine learning operations possible. Uh, we've been using different combinations of those in each of these workflows. Uh, today, heavily centered on notebooks, which are called workbenches here. So we're gonna go to our workbenches. We've already started the one that we're using today. So once I'm in my workbench, uh, there are two types. There are user managed, meaning I selected a compute type and I didn't pick GPUs, but I could have, and I've launched it up and it gives me a link to open JupyterLab. Uh, there's also managed ones where all that compute stuff is kind of managed automatically for you. I'm going to open up this Jupyter Lab that we've already created back in the O1 video. And I'll have my environment. Now it turns out I actually just made a few small changes to the GitHub and those aren't in my Jupyter Lab. So we're going to go fetch those updates. That's one of the great parts about uh, this video. Like, things may have changed by the time you watch this, but when you load this repository or refresh, you do a fresh pull of this repository, you are gonna get the latest and greatest content. So I'm gonna simulate that now. I pulled this yesterday when I was setting the video up, uh, but today I know a change is out there. I'm gonna come over here. It even puts a little orange dot there telling me, hey, there's new changes. You're behind by one commit. I'm gonna hit pull. It lets me know it successfully pulled it. Now, if I had made local changes that conflicted with the ones that came in, it would have given me a red box there and told me I had to reconcile those. Uh, but nothing tripped over itself. I'm going to open up that 05 notebook and we can start our journey through this workflow. Give that a second to get loaded here. All right, so I allude in the preface here that there are more notebooks in the series. All of the stuff that we're doing inside the notebook today, uh, well, that might not be efficient in future cases that we'll talk about at the end of the video. And you might wanna move them out into like a service with bigger compute, more VMs or more GPUs attached. Uh, we'll get to those examples. Uh, and it turns out I've set those up in the subsequent videos that are all gonna come off of this. Now today, uh, I'm gonna focus a lot on the little details of the entire model step because the center part of this VM, all the code that builds the model, it's actually identical across the entire O5 series. Uh, so I will pay a lot of attention to details today so that in those other videos, I can reference back to this one. All right, so now this is the video you're watching now. It's funny how that works. Uh, the prerequisites for this are that the data source is set up back to the O1 video. And rather than go through the overview, we're gonna dive in and look at what we're doing. So I like this, uh, I call this the uh, football play chart for this. You got all the Vertex AI services, star, we are in a notebook. What are we gonna do? We're gonna read records from a data source, BigQuery over here, into our notebook. We're gonna do it in a very interesting way we'll talk about. And then when we're done with our model, we're gonna move out to Vertex AI Prediction, which has multiple services. We're gonna register it as a model. We're gonna move that model to an endpoint so it can serve predictions for new requests through the API. All right. What does that look like from a user experience? Well, it looks like we went to Vertex AI Notebooks and step A, we made a notebook. And in the notebook, we're gonna do our training here. And when we're done, we're gonna push it out to a model and then we're gonna interact with that model at an endpoint. Uh, I need to make a change here to reference the current project we're working on, demo three. And what this does is set up some uh, global variables in my Python environment uh, that I'm gonna reuse lower down in the code. So I wanna always use the US Central One region for these demos. The data name is fraud, this notebook is 05. Uh, deploy compute, this is 
when I move that model to Vertex, I need to tell it what type of compute to use to do the scoring. So I give it a little instance, N1 in standard four, and for software on that, I give it a pre-built container of TensorFlow 2.3 CPUs only. So that address there. All right, a couple of variables to set up my model training. I wanna name the variable that I'm trying to predict. That's class, it's fraud one, or not fraud zero. So the name of that variable is class. Uh, variables that I don't want to include that might be in the incoming data set. Uh, the main one is gonna be, for one, class, uh, but also transaction ID. That's that unique row identifier for the credit card transaction. There's no reason to use that in prediction because uh, if that were important to explaining whether something was fraud or not, it's never going to be useful because that ID will never repeat again in the future. A uh, couple of terms we're going to use, and I'll describe these here and later when we get to them. Epochs. When you train a neural net, uh, the number of times you traverse the entire set of example training data uh, is an epoch or an epoch. Uh, you go through that data a number of times. Now you will eventually get a loss function that kind of flattens out and additional epics don't, don't gain you anything. Uh, you can look at a, model, a lot of model metrics to understand that and we will later. Uh, I'm gonna pick 10 here. And then I could load all my examples and try to do one big gradient step across the entire thing. Uh, but that tends to be computationally expensive and sometimes infeasible and not really that helpful sometimes. So you pick a step size. So if I have X number or N number of examples, I can take sets of them at a time. And those are batches. I'm going to choose a batch size of 100 and we will go in batches of 100 all the way up to all of the records and then start another epic and then batch sizes of 100. Let's run that cell to find the variables. We're gonna import the various Python packages we're gonna use. So we're gonna interact with BigQuery a bit. We're not gonna load the data from BigQuery directly. Uh, we're gonna interact with TensorFlow. Uh, TensorFlow IO has a BigQuery reader. That's how we're gonna actually get the records from BigQuery. Uh, I load the AI platform. That's how you interact with Vertex AI. Uh, and then a couple of other things to manipulate data. I'm gonna set up a client for Vertex. We won't be using it until we get down to the model deployment. I'm gonna set up a client for BigQuery. I'm gonna use it for just one or two things locally we'll talk about in just a second. Uh, and then parameters. I want to timestamp my work so it doesn't interfere with the one I ran before I made the video or ones I might run if I'm troubleshooting something I discover here. Uh, I'm gonna set up my bucket. That's my same name as my project ID, StatMic Demo 3 I'm going to set up a URI to the Google Cloud storage where I'm going to store the model. Uh, that I've given it a naming nomenclature of the bucket name, uh, the data name, fraud, uh, a subfolder called models, and under there, a, a subfolder for this notebook, 05. And a local directory under temp that also I can store things locally before I move them to the GS bu uh, GCS bucket. I'm gonna make that local directory, just show you what that looks like under temp. You see all the other videos have made notebooks. Well, we've got an 05 folder here now. It's empty, we haven't done anything, but as we run this code, things will show up there. All right, I'm gonna take advantage of the fact our sample data, our example data is sitting in BigQuery. So it's not just rows and columns, but BigQuery has information about those columns, like their names, their data types, whether they're integers or floats or strings. Well, I can get that information about the table that I wanna use in BigQuery without actually loading all the data. BigQuery has uh, tables uh, or views called information schema. It's got a lot of metrics about all kinds of things. I should do an entire separate set of uh, videos on BigQuery. Uh, the one I want to take advantage of here is the information schema that has a table called columns. What that means is I give it a data name, so that's the data set in BigQuery, and that, in this case it's fraud in my current project, and I go to the information schema view and ask for columns, and then for every table inside that data set, it'll give one row per column per table, uh, and then the information about that column. 
Right. Well, I only really care about one table in this data set, and that is fraud underscore prepped, where we've added the splits column and the transaction ID and all the good stuff. Um, I can put a where statement to say, only give me the schema for that table, and then give me all the columns here. We're only gonna use two, but let's grab them all. So I run this, and since I'm not loading the whole table, it's really, really fast. Uh, one row per column, and I have a table name, fraud prepped. I have the column name, time, v1, v2. Those are those uh, PCA, uh, principal component generated factors that describe the data set, uh, the original one. We don't know what they mean. Uh, that's, they've done this to more or less uh, obfuscate the information to make it a little more secure. Um, I get the data type. I know that time is stored as an integer here. Uh, it's number of seconds since the first transaction. Uh, all of the principal components are float 64. And my splits column, well, that's a string. It says train test validate. Uh, transaction ID, that's a string. The class variable, that's 01. It's stored as an int 64. Uh, that's the two columns of information I need to kind of set up the flow of data into my model column names, data types of columns. Uh, a lot of times I find myself reading CSVs and I'm manually coding this in. When it's in BigQuery or other managed data sources, I can go grab schemas and reuse that information, especially if I'm using all the columns or most of them. This is great. Uh, another thing I'm gonna want when I build my model is in that target variable, I'm doing classification, fraud, not fraud. Uh, this code's very reusable for classification models. Uh, I let it go take the column that's the class and come back and show me all the levels and count them for me in case it wasn't just fraud, not fraud. It was fraud, likely fraud, and definite fraud, something interesting like that. Uh, it could have any number of classes, and this, would, this little piece of code would grab that for me. Now, how does it do it? It goes and runs a big query query, select distinct values of the target column, remember that's stored in the local variable var target. And that data set that we just looked at, fraud, fraud prepped, uh, where uh, that target column is not empty or null. So it goes and it says, hey, I see zeros and I see ones. And then I do a quick uh, check of the shape of this. The shape gives me the size, the number of rows, the, uh, the first index, the zero index is number of rows. And it says, hey, you get two rows, which means there's two unique classes in that target variable. Well, I've stored this information and we're gonna use it as we go on. I've stored the schema and I've stored the number of classes. I'm kinda done directly touching BigQuery here. Now, I want to set up reading the information from BigQuery with uh, the BigQuery, uh, or the TensorFlow IO BigQuery Reader. Uh, the way I'm going to do that is set up a list of the variable names and a list of the variable types. Uh, so first, variable names. I know there's certain ones I want to exclude. I stored that in the var omit above. So I'm going to take the var omit and make a list from it, uh, split it. And there's only one variable in it this time, but there could be multiple. Uh, and then I'm going to append onto that the additional column I know needs to also be omitted, which is the splits column that says train test validate. That's not something I want to predict on. It's something I want to separate the data on. Uh, so I want to omit those. And then I'm going to go, I'm going to create a variable, a list in Python called selected fields, where I take the schema, I subset it to, remember schema is rows per column. I'm going to subset it to the rows that represent the columns I want to keep by ignoring the ones I want to omit. That's the don't keep the ones where the columns in the omit list. And then I want to convert the column column name into a list. And that's what this does. So now I have just this simple list of column names for all the variables I want to use in my model. Now I want to do the exact same logic to go to the D type, the data type column and grab those and make a list in the exact same order. Uh, but I'm gonna do a little conversion. If the D type is float 64, or use D types dot float 64 if the string in that column says capital float 64. So I'm basically saying the schema tells me in string it's a float 64. 
I'm gonna make this list actually have a local data type of dtypes.float64. Now if I look above in my Python imports, I see that I went to TensorFlow Python framework and I imported dtypes. So I'm basically reading the string and now assigning it the appropriate dtype for what the schema is telling me the variable is. All right, that sets us up with two lists. List of variables, list of the data types for those variables that we can use. Now, when I read these records in for TensorFlow, it, it's great because I got all these columns, but one column is different than the others. All of the columns are features except one is the target variable, the Y, the thing I want to predict. So I'm going to make a little function that records go through on the way into TensorFlow and it transforms them. In this case, it's a very simple transform. It's going to pop off that one column and store it as the target and keep all the others as a feature set, multiple columns, one column per feature. And I'm also going to take the target and I'm going to do a little transformation on it. So let's take a look. I'm going to bring up a highlighter here. Help me annotate this a bit. I'm going to first assign, bring in that row dictionary. So all the records are going to come in, all the columns, that list of variables. I'm going to pop off the target variable and store it in target. And then I'm going to additionally transform target to be one hot encoded. Now what this means is it has values zero and one. It's going to make two columns where whenever it's a zero, the first column is a one. And whenever it's not a zero, the first column is zero. And whenever it's a one, the second column will say one, it is a one, or zero, it's not a one. So it's kind of the same info. You, you technically don't have to do this when you just have two classes. You can pick a lower below, I'm gonna use categorical cross entropy uh, in my model. Uh, I could choose binary and I'm just predicting the probability of one. I, again, like I said a little earlier, I wanted to make this code very generic so or general, so I could use it for a lot of types of class data. Uh, so I'm gonna pretend like it could be three or four or five classes or more. So I take that one column, zero, one, and I turn it into two columns, is a zero, is a one, zero ones. And then I cast those uh, one hot coded columns as float 32s, and then I return them so basically, a big set of columns comes in, it gets transferred into two separate sets of columns. One is the class variable one hot encoded, and the other is all the features, and it transfers those out. So this function is gonna do all of that for us. Oops, let me turn off my annotation tool here. Let's run that piece of code. And all that's going to do is register our function for us. Now, TensorFlow IO is a set of readers for TensorFlow for like these managed data sources. Uh, specifically, today we're going to use BigQuery. Now, if you just have records stored in a GCS bucket, uh, or you've already got it in a pandas data frame or a NumPy array, uh, those you know, TensorFlow can handle directly. Uh, in this case, we want to manage reading from this source, this managed uh, data warehouse, BigQuery, uh, and we can use a little more sophistication. First, I'll set up the reading from it using everything we've just done, and then when we do a read, you'll see how this gives us a lot of additional capabilities. Uh, so what I'm going to do is make this function that defines a reader to BigQuery. Now, Above, from TensorFlow I.O., I imported the BigQuery client. That's not a BigQuery direct client. That's a TensorFlow I.O. You know, API to the BigQuery storage read API that's going to do all these fancy things for us. We just have to feed it some parameters. So I set up a reader. And then with that reader, I set up a class that's a read session. And that's where I define how I want to read from BigQuery. So I'm going to call this training reader.readsession. Uh, first, uh, what is the parent project that's going to run the read? Uh, in our case, it's the same as the project that the data's in. So I just say projects, project ID, that's stat mic demo three. 
And then the project ID is also StatMic Demo3. I could make that first one different if I wanted one project to run the query reading the data from Demo3, uh, StatMic Demo3. Now under there, there is a data set ID, that's fraud. And there's a table under there that is fraud underscore prepped. Uh, I need to tell it, hey, when you get to that table, uh, do you want all the columns or do you want a subset of the columns? Well, we made a list of the columns we want called selected fields above. And hey, uh, as you read them in, what data type do you want to assign to them? Well, we made that output types above and we can put that list here. <clears throat> now you can, instead of selected fields being a list, you can make it a dictionary that includes the data type as well. And then you wouldn't need output types. So that's available if you'd like to. Uh, I don't want all the rows in that table. I'm going to separately read training records from validation records from test records. So whatever gets fed to this function is going to be my split column. And I'm going to say, hey, subset, this is like a where clause to where splits equal that input. And then one of the fancy features of this is I can set up how many you know, straws I want to put into the BigQuery uh, milkshake to suck the records through. And I'm gonna request three streams here. You can request a lot and it may throttle you down to less you know, based on your compute environment. Uh, I'm gonna pick three here and it'll do at most three. Uh, it could do less, it'll never do more. Um, if you got a big beefy compute environment that you're using, you could set this to be a very, very big number if you're trying to read a lot for a single batch. In it, or you have just tons of columns or different data types that might be bigger like images or text. Now I'm gonna use this function to set up multiple reads from BigQuery. Uh, I'm gonna set up one to read the training records, one to read the validation records, and one to read the test records. Now I'm gonna annotate, this is probably the most important section of data reading in this notebook is understanding the coolness that's happening in these rows. The, I'm taking advantage of both BigQuery and TensorFlow I.O. to do something kind of neat that helps my model training below. Be very efficient because I'm working from a notebook. So let me turn my annotation tool on here and let's have a little fun with this. All right, so first I am going to the reader and I'm passing it, you know, the split column. So trains can ask for train, validates can ask for validate, tests can ask for test. The first thing I'm gonna do is tell it to do a parallel reading of rows. Let me get my annotation tool on. Well, I could pass this additional parameters to tell, tell it how many parallel reads or there's another number of other features if you wanna get really, really detailed, uh, but it's gonna to default to the number of streams that are in the reader. So this tells it, hey, instigate or you know, init initialize using those streams to read them in par to read rows in parallel. So when it says training data, it's going to first say, oh, go to the BigQuery reader, this particular reader, uh, and ask for train records. So that's subsetting to training rows. Well, there's a lot of them, a couple of hundred thousand here, and it's going to then say, well, read them in parallel. So set up multiple reads. It's simultaneously. Uh, it turns out it's going to try to set up three of them because of this record right here. Well, the next thing I'm going to do, let's change colors here, is as we go through the model training, we have epics and they read in batch sizes. Well, batch sizes are here at the end. I'm going to ask for only batch size is a local parameter of 100 hundred rows at a time. So each of these readers is going to attempt to read 100 records through three straws at one time. Now I'm going to do a few things to those streams while it's reading and that's what the other parts in the middle are. One thing is as it reads those records through three straws trying to get 100 at a time is it's going to do that mapping that we defined in the map table. So that says, well, I read all the columns, I'm gonna split the one off and I'm gonna one hot encode it. And that's the target variable class. So it transfers the 100 coming through three straws as they read in, uh, but it does something else. Uh, it wants to read 100, but you can imagine a model reading 100, 
Using the 100 to do a training step, update the gradient, read another 100. Well, computers have multiple cores. They can do things simultaneously. Let's take advantage of that and let's tell it, hey, read 100. And while you're doing a training step, go ahead and start reading another 100 so they're ready. And now instead of you know stair-stepping, going read, train, read, train, I could read, train, and read next, train, and read next, and I can get my model to run a little faster by doing these data operations in parallel to the model training. The way I do that is I use, let's pick a color here, prefetching. Now I could give prefetch a integer of how many steps I want to make sure are kind of cached and available to training. I'm just gonna prefetch one here because I have a simple model and it's running in a local notebook on a single VM. Uh, that only has four virtual cores, it turns out. So prefetch one, so grab one, train it. And while you're training it, grab the next one. And while you're training that one, grab the next one, and, and so forth. So I've shrunk the number of operations that are running in sequence to about a half as many, uh, minus one. <coughs> next, at the point where you're training, you don't necessarily want to read the same 100 for a batch uh, in the same order every time. You might wanna put some variability in there. So what I can do is I can set up kind of a, of the entire BigQuery table, the several hundred thousand records for training, I can kind of set up a, a cache first that I then pull the batches from. And when it sets up that little cache, it's like a, it's like a shuffle heap. I can give it you know a size, and I like to do it as a multiple of, how, of a batch size. So I'm gonna kind of start this shuffle and let's highlight that with another color. Let's make it orange. I'm gonna say, hey, make a shuffle that has 10x the batch size. So that's gonna say, well, instead of 100 for a batch, go grab 1,000. And then the batch will be chosen from that 1,000. Now, as soon as I take 100 out, or one at a time even, it's going to load in more and it's going to keep a shuffle size of a thousand until it gets to the end of the number of examples and it'll start depleting it until it's empty. And then it'll, you know, for the next epic, go over and start over and load another thousand and then keep regenerating it as batches are extracted until it's exhausted and then another epic starts. Uh, you don't need that for validation and testing because you're not updating the gradient or anything else on those intermittent training steps for batches. Uh, you're only uh, you're doing it for an entire epic. So I don't use the shuffle for the validation and the test data. Uh, so I spent a lot of time on those three rows because that kind of optimizes a lot of things about both the reading of data from a managed data source like BigQuery. Again, TensorFlow has a, IO has these readers for other sources as well. And it kind of dictates things that are gonna be happening when I get to my model training step below. So let me uh, erase our annotations and we can run these two cells. Wait for my cursor to catch up here. Our BigQuery reader and then set those up. Let's see what error did I run in here? In classes is not defined. That means I explained it in the video, but I forgot to run it above. So let me go back up and run <laughs> those two. And just make sure I ran these as well. The reader, and now we can run that again. And it runs without error. So it hasn't read the records yet, but it's set up the reader, it has a session, and it's ready to go. Uh, we can, before we get to our model training, we could actually use one of these readers to just go fetch a record and take a look at it. So let's take the training one, and let's go ask for one, which is actually a batch of 100. Uh, and let's print out a list of the, well, it's going to return two objects, the features and the training. So let's first print out the column names from features. That would be the keys of that dictionary. And from the target, let's grab just the first 10 of the 100 and take a look and see what they look like. So training, that use that whole thing we just piped to go 
grab this information for us and it says, hey, I see all these columns. Notice uh, the ones that aren't there are the class variable, uh, the splits column and the transaction ID. Those have all been omitted. And notice that our one zero uh, column for fraud not fraud is showing up as two columns. Uh, is a zero happens most of the time. We know that in our record, most things are not fraud. Uh, the second row that it read in this batch uh, was fraud. So we see as it gets a zero for not fraud and it gets a one for is fraud and all the others get zero for is fraud. So you just see how it, you know, one hot encoded is what that's called. Now let's use that data that is being read from TensorFlow IO uh, as an input and build a model architecture and train a model. Uh, so the next step of this code is going to lead us into that. I put some notes here of links. Uh, I'm going to describe all this uh, pretty exhaustively here. So I'm going to scroll up so we can see. Um, we're building a model architecture. So you can think of this as like a graph and you have these steps and things that are connected. Uh, I first need to say, well, what is going into the graph? Well, the feature columns, this is going to be a dictionary where it's going to have key, header, okay? Value is going to be a type of value. So a TensorFlow feature column that is numeric in the case of all of our features, it turns out. Uh, of that header column. For header in, hey, remember selected fields, that list of columns that we're reading? We're reusing it here. Uh, for any of those selected fields other than the target variable, we want to set up one of these numeric features named that name. Uh, now, we've got the names set up as features. We need to put some data into those features. So the next thing is feature layer inputs, another dictionary, same keys, but the values are gonna be uh, Keras, that high level API for TensorFlow, uh, layers that are uh, kind of tensors, they're inputs of data values. Now each of these has a single column, each feature is one column in our case, uh, and an unknown number of rows, it's the batch size. Uh, and the name is the value of header. For every header in, again, selected fields, for all the selected fields other than the target variable. So I've set up feature columns, a list of the names of the columns for TensorFlow, and I've inserted in a values into those columns in the form of Keras tensors. Now I can construct my model architecture. Uh, the feature layer comes in, its outputs are gonna be basically line up all those feature columns into one uh, big multi-dimensional tensor, uh, one column per feature, and then rows per example for a batch. And the input into that is this tensor or feature layer inputs we just constructed. So I'm basically saying, take all the individual features and combine them into one big multi-dimensional feature. Uh, the best way to illustrate what's happening in these three commands is to take a look at the graph. If you, when we're done, you can uh, use this Keras utility to plot the model. All of the individual inputs are named here. It's kind of hard to see unless I get really close, but like a mount V1, V2, V3, and it says, hey, they're each uh, unknown number of rows because it hasn't read a batch, it doesn't know yet, uh, but it's one column. And they're going to all map into this dense feature that's basically all of those columns, you know, kind of brought together and lined up one dense feature. So that now has 30 columns and an unknown number of rows. Uh, so we read them all into this dense feature. Haven't done any training yet. We've just kind of been a librarian. We've organized our books and we put them on the shelf together. The next thing we're going to do is uh, a data preparation step. Uh, these are all these numeric columns. One common thing that I like to do, it's very helpful in this model, you can try running this model without this step and see what I mean, is I want to normalize them. Now normalize in this case means, you know, take all the examples, uh, subtract the mean from every example, and divide by the variation of all the examples and kind of standardize them. Um, what I chose to use here is called batch normalization. That means for each batch, it's going to calculate the mean and the standard deviation. 
And it's going to remember that and do like a moving average of the mean and the variance as it goes through batches. And at the end, it's going to remember kind of the overall one and make that part of the model that can be served when you save the model so that when a new prediction request comes in, it knows how to normalize it. If you've got TensorFlow 2.6 or later, you can actually, instead of batch normalization, do normalization. And what's called an adapt method uh, is like this pre-training step. It'll go through all the batches, calculate the overall mean and the overall variance, and do an overall normalization. And then remember those parameters for model serving as well. Uh, so you can do that also. Uh, I highly recommend def I highly recommend using that especially if you don't have a lot of examples. Uh, in the case where you have giant data, you might actually find this to be a very efficient way of doing this. Uh, I also recommend trying both and seeing the difference. So once I have batch normalized, notice that's just, hey, I've got this big dense tensor, all the columns brought together on the same shelf. I pass them through here so that every column gets batch normalized. Uh, still haven't trained a model. Uh, let's now do the world's simplest model. I think this might be the simplest. We're going to add a single dense layer, and it's going to take those 30 normalized features, and it's going to map them to a layer with just two, the in classes, 0, 1 classes, and the way it's going to squeeze into that is it's going to use an activation function. In this case, we're going to use softmax. Uh, you could use sigmoid if you had just treated this like the binary data that it is. <clears throat> but since we've one hot encoded, you could have more than two. Uh, softmax handles you know, the logic of multiple binary mappings uh, is one way to kind of describe it. Um, <clears throat> So we're basically squeezing 30 into two levels, and that's the output of our model. Uh, it's basically gonna give us predicted value of zero, predicted value of one, and those will add to one. Uh, so the input to that layer is the previous layer, the batch normalization, and if I look down here, way down here in tiny little writing, it says, hey, there's a dense uh, layer with that brings in 30 columns and it outputs two columns. Now we've defined our model stack that we want to train through, and it's stored in this variable layers. Now what we want to do is define our model, and it's a TensorFlow Keras model. Its input is that feature layer inputs where you define how the data gets in above, and its output is that big stack of you know, mapped logic, that graph for ML and TensorFlow. So it's going to bring the records in, it's going to pass them through that graph as an output. All right, so that's our model. And now we want to do things with our model. We want to train it. The way you train it is you have to give it an objective, a thing to train against. In our case, we're going to use an optimization method of the TF Kara's uh, stochastic gradient descent. So instead of micro-batching or a full batch, uh, we're going to have it randomly <coughs> pick its way down this gradient. Uh, an alternative to this might be Atom. You can look that up. Um, we're going to give it a loss function, the thing that it's actually minimizing, uh, and we're going to use categorical cross entropy. This is the point where had you not won hot encoded and you left it as a 0, 1 class variable, you would pick binary cross entropy in this spot. And that's that loss function that gets updated after each batch and after, all the, after each of the epics. Now we've defined these two pieces of our model. We're going to compile our model with that optimiz optimizer and that loss function. And we can also tell it at this point what metrics we want it to calculate at each gradient update. Uh, in this case, that's after each batch and after each epic. Uh, we want accuracy. Well, that's one of its defaults. You can just name it. Uh, we also want to ask for this one that's more custom. Uh, it's TensorFlow cares metrics, error under the curve, specifically the precision recall curve. You could also put ROC here. But we know from the previous videos, we have this imbalance in our input data. We have very few fraud records and a whole bunch of not fraud. That makes sense. Very few transactions are fraud. Our goal is to identify that small subset and act on it. <clears throat> well, a great way to handle that 
imbalance that we talked about is using the precision recall curve as one of our measures of accuracy, not actually accuracy, which could be uh, a little misleading when you have imbalance. But I'm going to output both. And when I run this, compiles the model, it builds a graph of the model with the next step. We've been kind of looking at that as we go. It actually saves that graph if you wanted to use that somewhere else. You could open up the PNG file. Oh, that's actually much larger. I should have been reviewing it in there. So we see the individual inputs go into this dense input that has all of them on the same shelf. Multi-dimensional tensor. Uh, it outputs, it doesn't know the batches, the reason why is the batch size yet. So that's why there's a question mark. Uh, and it knows it's 30 columns, 30 features. Runs that 30 outputs 30 because it's just going through a batch normalization step. And then that goes to a dense layer with two outputs that is going through an activation function of sigmoid. All right. Now another way you could do this is ask for the model summary and it gives you a tabular text version of that chart where each layer is presented and then it's presented as an input to the next layer, which is an input to the next, and it calculates the number of parameters that it's gonna be estimating as it goes through this, uh, which also includes the number of non-trainable parameters. Remember we have that uh, batch normalization step uh, and that's gonna have non-trainable parameters. It's not actually doing gradient descent at that point. All right, we've built a model architecture. We've piped data into it. And now we want to actually train it against training records. And the way we do that is what's in this next cell. Now the first thing, at every after every batch, it can calculate our metrics and it can do a gradient update before the next batch. Um, and it's going to do that as it goes through all the records and when it exhausts them and Epic is done and it starts another one and we've asked for 10. Uh, I want to save that information and the way you save those is called a callback in TensorFlow. So I'm going to write a TensorFlow callback. It's got a shape here and it's TensorFlow cares callbacks tensor board. We'll talk about that. We're going to review this stuff visually with uh, something called tensor board when we're done. Uh, I need to give it a directory to save it in, and that's a local path. Remember, we made up that temp05 folder before, and it's going to go in there. It's going to make a subdirectory called logs uh, with the date time of right now, and it's going to save all that information from the batches and the epics as it goes through into that folder. Now, then I tell it, hey, we actually want to store the information too as it's running. So history is going to be model dot the class fit. Now this is the point where we're actually training the model. So we're going to fit it. We're going to feed it the train uh, variable in Python here. Now remember train actually returns two things. It returns X features, all the feature columns and Y, uh, the one hot encoded class variable. Uh, and then I'm going to tell it callbacks. Well, as you, create callbacks, you're going to route them to this specific one that you've defined, TensorBoard callback. Now, after every epic, I also want it to go to my validation data and calculate the metrics on that and use that to inform this process. Uh, that does, the validation does, data doesn't get used after each batch, it gets used after each epic to take a quick look at saying, well, how well does this model generalize? Uh, and you, you kind of want to watch that as a model trains because you can see when you've underfit and also when you've overfit, you know, your loss function looks great on the training data and looks awful on the validation data. It means you've gone too far, you've overinformed your model, you've overfit. Uh, so it's good to have that in there and we're going to be able to see the visual of it side by side uh, when we're done. So let's do this. Now, I'm going to hit run here. I'm in a notebook, it's in a local VM. It's an N1 standard four, so four uh, virtual CPUs, uh, so it can run four threads. Uh, what I see going on down here, there's, it's giving me some notes. I know it shows up in red. There's nothing here that says it's an error. Um, it's showing me the first epic running. Now, a step is a batch. So 
It's telling me it's running about 17 milliseconds per step. Total time, 32, 33. It's a constant counter of how long this uh, Epic has been running. It shows me, well, it doesn't yet know how many batches it's going to encounter because it hasn't been through all the data full time yet. Uh, we just got to Epic 2, so now we see it knows 2281 is the total number of batches that when times 100 gives you the total number of rows, that last batch may have been smaller than 100 uh, if it didn't divide evenly. <clears throat> and then across all those batches, we knew it took 44 seconds. It typically took 19 uh, milliseconds per step. Uh, the loss function at the end of that epic was 0 0.0883. We can see it updating batch by batch in the second one down here. The overall accuracy, even though we've said that's a bad metric, uh, we know to be basically 98% here. And the area under the curve way of measuring accuracy is 0.9907. That's actually really good, even on the first uh, epic there. On the validation data, we see that it's actually lower for loss in the first ep epic, and accuracies are also very good. So even on the first pass through the data, uh, maybe this data being common for in machine learning challenges, it's actually kind of easy to train. This is a very simple model. This is just logistic regression being done as a, neur uh, as a neural net. This is going to keep running 10 times through the data, those 10 epics. And at the end, we're going to be able to, well, in a crude way, just look down the rows here and see how the loss function minimizes and how accuracy increases. Uh, but then we're also going to look at overall metrics for the training data and for the test data and the validation data. But then we're even going to use TensorBoard to visualize it. Uh, what I'm going to do, because this is running, what, 45 seconds per epic, so we got another six or seven minutes for this to go. I'm gonna to go to the title screen and uh, just return at the end of that and we'll take a look at it. And we are back so we can move back to our training and see how it finished up. Let's take a look here. So all 10 epics have finished and they continue to run about the same amount of time each. We can see that the Loss function is minimizing and even kind of flatlining here. And our accuracy has also kind of hit almost a one. Um, and even in the validation set, that's occurring. Uh, let's look at different ways of looking at this information. In the AutoML and in the logistic regression with BigQuery, we did some model evaluation. Let's do some general model evaluation here as well. So one is, I, when I did that training, I. I allowed it to store into a history variable. Uh, I can go into that history variable and pull out the loss of the last record. I can get that specifically. And we see, hey, that 0048 there is stored here. Uh, let's get that information for our test set. Now remember, test is data that we kind of held out. And so far it hasn't even been brought in. Like the models had zero exposure to it. So if it can accurately predict fraud, not fraud in that set, uh, we should be in very good shape to deploy this model and use it. So let's do that evaluation. Uh, it still goes through the batch size. Now there's fewer records because this was like 10% of the data back when we set it up in the 01 video. 285 records total. And what we see is we have very low loss and very high accuracy. So it's very good on the test data. Uh, even though we've seen it on the validation data, we could do this same metric viewing for the validation data and the training data again. Should just replicate the values that we saw on that last epic above. And sure enough, we see on the validation data, the same loss. And the training data was a little larger, so that'll take a few more seconds, it's about halfway through, We're looking for that 2281 here. And as that wraps up, what we're gonna do in the next step is basically take our record from our test data, now that's taking a batch, and sending it over and asking it to predict with the model. 
So that's local prediction. We'll talk about how that could be handy in a second. So there we go. We can see we have replicated with the test data or the training data. Now, model prediction. In the real world, there's not many cases where you could imagine using the notebook to also do future predictions. Because uh, you'd have to open the notebook up and load this model. Uh, you could pickle it and save it. You could TensorFlow save it. You could, you could do things like to save the model and then load the model and then bring new records in. Uh, that's not very automatic. So we're going to look at below how to automate that using Vertex AI. What you want to do here is you test the model with individual predictions. So I've got this test variable, which is a link to BigQuery through the TensorFlow IO. I can go ask it for one. Now that's going to go get a whole batch, um, which is 100 examples. And then run that through the model, dot predict, that class, predict. And just review the first one and see what it looks like. So the first of the 100. And what I see is uh, well, it's a very high probability that this is zero, not fraud. And uh, the remaining very low probability is that it would be a one. So this, this is not fraud. Uh, I could continue to look at that for other records in there, like the first record. Or I could even remove the index and look at it for the entire batch. And I could see 100 predictions. Let's see if we can find one that was not, that is fraud. Okay, this one looks like it's predicting is fraud. And here's another one that's is fraud. It's not quite as high. It's like 82% is fraud and 18% not fraud, but it's good to see that that prediction's predicting both ways. Uh, remember when we're looking at confusion matrices, you would hate a model that just said everything's not fraud. It would be right 98% of the time, but only because there's very little fraud, that imbalance thing. We want to see it going both ways. Now, a better way to visualize. Turns out TensorFlow, we talked about this at the beginning of the video, has this amazing ecosystem of tools that enable the entire process from getting data in and all different types of model architectures, uh, deploying models, even in JavaScript with uh, TensorFlow.js. Well, here, there's also a tool called TensorBoard that allows us to visualize this information. We could even visualize it in real time while the model's running. We'll see that in some of the other 05 videos. But I'm going to load TensorBoard right here in the notebook. Now, it's already been pip installed. Uh, there's actually a magic where you can call TensorBoard. I'm going to load that magic. We're in a notebook, so magics are like a native way of doing things automatically. And I'm going to load that TensorBoard magic, and it needs those records, those logs, uh, in order to present them visually. Uh, well, we've created that TensorFlow callback, and we saved it into this local log directory. Remember, we set up temp and 05, and under logs, there would be a folder with the date. And look, train and validation. We gave it both data sets when we trained the model. And under each of these, we have these log files. Now, we don't have to open those and look at them manually like we've, like we've been doing. Uh, what we can do is feed those logs to TensorBoard and see what happens. And we get this nice little visual interface that allows us to do everything we've been doing in numbers and text visually. And here we go. So we see there are runs. There's the training run and the validation run that went alongside it. And we see uh, we can interact with this plot and see the information with each of the epics. Uh, and we even see the data sometimes updating by the batches, it looks like. I didn't realize that. Um, as we go across this, we see the training data loss or the accuracy is going up and up and up. We even have the area under the curve accuracy here. Look at that. And the validation data. And we can see that, yeah, we could have probably even stopped after maybe seven or eight epics because things are flatlining. Uh, they're not overfitting. Overfitting would be where the uh, accuracy for the uh, training data keeps going up and the accuracy for the uh, validation data maybe flatlines lower or even you know, retreats. Um, 
We could do the same thing for the loss function. You can see that coming down. And they nicely converge and get a very good answer here. Uh, so we have a lot of confidence in this model's ability to perform. One, it's, it's optimized, it's doing a good job, and it's, it's accurate. Uh, just like in the other uh, BQML and AutoML where we built models and we deployed them, let's deploy this model. Uh, we don't necessarily want to bring all our new records over to this notebook and run them through. Like Somebody's job is to daily fetch new records and uh, run them through the prediction thing and then push them out to some other service. Let's go host this TensorFlow model add a Vertex AI endpoint and treat it like an API and just score on demand. Or once it's saved as a model in uh, Vertex AI, we could even use it for batch predictions. So by doing this, what we're going to do is we are going to save the model. Now, just like model had fit and model had predict classes, the model has a save class. And what you feed the save class is a location to save it. Uh, up above, we built a URI variable with global scope that is a Google Cloud storage bucket gs colon forward slash you name it we are going to tell it save the model but save it out there in that common place the gcs bucket in this project and it tells us that it's finished doing that now what we want to do now is go to vertex ai and use the API to interact with Vertex AI and upload from that GCS bucket to a Vertex AI model. So we feed it that same URI, we give it a label, notebook 05, uh, we tell it the container that it's going to use whenever you do deploy it, how do you compute, uh, what software to use, so the deployment image, and we give it a display name so we can identify it in the Vertex console. We run this. That's very, very quick. Let's actually go over to the console and take a look at that. So if I go to models, I'll get the list of all the 02, 03, and now 05 model. As that populates here. Here we go, 05, fraud, and then the timestamp when we we're building the model. See, it even has the label that we assigned. We can click into this, and we'll see information about it. We could deploy to endpoint just clicking here. We're going to go back and do it in code. Um, we can even look at model properties. And what we see is the container that we've asked for it to be used with and the location of the artifact that's here, which is that Google Cloud storage bucket. It's the project name, is the bucket name, and subfolder fraud, subfolder model, subfolder 05. All right, so we want to go back to our code, and we want to do the same steps we've done before. We're going to create an endpoint. That's pretty quick. We're going to name our endpoint after the same project here, 05, uh, with the timestamp. And we can re retrieve that name after it's finished. That should only take a few seconds. And then our next job is to take that you know, model that's saved there in this endpoint and deploy that model. And it'll get a deployment ID uh, on the endpoint so that we can request predictions from it. So the way we deploy, we say deploy, we give it which model to deploy to, what name to give the deployed model. We're going to actually give it the same name. Uh, how much traffic to route that way? Well, it's a new endpoint. It's the first model. Let's give it all the traffic. If we were replacing a model, we might first split traffic between the old model and the new. Uh, what compute do you want to use for this endpoint? Well, that's the variable we defined above in one standard four. And we know this is just a demo, so we're going to keep it at only one instance. So if it starts getting a lot of requests, it won't scale out of the one and start scaling up and adding more in one standard force to handle the load. Um, but that would be handy if you knew you had a model that was going to you know, have spiky loads and retrieve a lot of traffic at times. It would scale automatically for you just by simply picking a bigger max replica here. So we're going to do this deployment. That's going to take anywhere from 5 to 10 minutes. Uh, what I'm going to do is go back to the title screen, pause the video, and then come back, and we will review this and create some predictions from our endpoint, and then wrap up with a conversation about all the work we've done here. So let's 
jump over to the title screen and pause for a moment. It looks like the endpoint is done. Let's get back to our screen share here. And that's complete. Let's jump over to the console and verify that. What we do is click on endpoints. We should now see an 05 endpoint. And there it is, it is active. If I click in, I should see what model has been deployed to this. And we see that 05 model, oops, it blinked on us. It'll be right back. All right, the 05 fraud model with the timestamp is in there, receiving 100% of the traffic. We are ready to go. Let's go back to our notebook. And just like before, what we're gonna do is, uh, well now we're, we're kind of out of that model training phase and we've got a deployed model. We could almost be in a new notebook at this point. We're basically gonna go, I wanna interact with that endpoint uh, and request predictions. Well, I need some records to do predictions. So for this example, we're gonna, manufacture the records from the original source. We're gonna use the BigQuery direct client. We're gonna go to it, take all the columns, uh, or go grab 10 rows, all the columns from the test data, and put it in a pandas data frame so it's local here. We can review it, take a look at it. We see all those beautiful columns with their values. We are going to then construct it into uh, an object, we'll call this new ob, uh, that's oriented in records. Uh, let's actually take a look at that and see what it looks like. Let's enter a new cell here. We can just type new ob, and then it'll make sense what we're constructing here from the uh, pandas data frame that we created. We have basically a dictionary of ver column name, variable name, uh, as the key and the value being the value from it. And we get different entries. In this case, we requested just the first row with index zero. And we are gonna take that and parse it into instances and values with the JSON format and now we can say we've constructed this prediction request. So you can imagine we're the app developer, we've shaped our prediction, and we want to send it to an API and get back a response. Well, first we're gonna use a Python client, and then we're gonna use a REST client, and then we'll even use uh, the G Cloud command line interface uh, from Google. Uh, right here, prediction, we're gonna go to the endpoint, we're gonna feed it the instances and parameters, and see what we get back. Our response is a prediction with a list here that shows us the probability of being a zero and the probability of being a one. This record turns out to be a zero. Uh, it tells us what model it used for prediction and explanations is none. We haven't set this up for that. That'll be a future video or even do explanations on custom models. Um, we can fetch just the prediction part of that by subsetting to that element of the response. And if we wanted, we could even say, well, which probability, what's the index of the highest probability? So that's the predicted class. Is it a zero or is it a one? In this case, we can see very clearly that the zero space, but maybe we had a model where we're predicting 10 different classes and we wanted to automatically say, what's the highest predicted class? In this case, it would tell us zero, it's a little piece of code from Python. Now let's do the same thing <clears throat> uh, using REST. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna formulate our request into a JSON file in our local folder. We can even take a look at that. We can go to temp and 05 and see that file we just created and we see that it's just a nice JSON representation of that same thing we were creating in Python. Key value pairs. And then we're gonna do a curl and get some authorization using, well, we're already authenticated in this environment. So let's load that with the gcloud command. 
Now let's send over our request and get back a response. And that response, nice little JSON section here, a little dictionary that shows us here's the predictions. Is they're the same values because the same endpoint with the same inputs gives us the same outputs. Uh, we even get not just the deployed model ID, but the original model ID. Remember, in case the model gets updated, but the deployment doesn't automatically get updated, these get individual IDs. Um, we could also use, uh, if we're in Google Cloud, or we're authenticated against it with this command line utility called gcloud, we could ask for AI endpoints predict. We could give it the endpoint name, the region, and that same JSON file. And it will also say, hey, I used this endpoint and I got these predictions. So with that, we have done a lot today. Now, this is the longest video in the series yet. I tried to be exhaustive in my explanations. Uh, I can think back. There are probably a few places where I was loose with my words. Uh, it's okay to hit the comments. It's okay to file a GitHub issue against this if you want to have a chat about any of the individual pieces. Uh, in some places I might not have gone deep enough and other places you're probably going, man, this guy went way too deep. Um, I'm going to reference this video in all the rest of the O5 series because that model building step, it's actually going to stay the same. We're just going to deploy it in different ways. Um, to talk about that, we should probably go to Q and A and just answer the most general question that's going to be asked here. And that is. Hi, Mike. It sounds like notebooks are perfect for training models. Are there cases where I need anything else? Well, it's easy to think the notebook is perfect. I mean, especially in the cloud where I could just crank this notebook up again with a larger compute instance. I could attach GPUs to it. It, it even automatically does things like configure CUDA for me so that I can use TensorFlow against GPUs. I could do a lot just making it bigger um, that doesn't necessarily make it more efficient because then I'm running that entire instance and it's on and it's relying on me to go into it and click run uh, and for me to stop it. Uh, at some point, especially if you're doing lots of models, it's better to, in my mind, I love notebooks for development. Maybe a subset of data, uh, try a lot of different model architectures, uh, really get a feel for how to construct the model training. Uh, and then I want to do even like a development or a test run on full data on a large scale. Well, I want to offload out of the notebook into a service that allows me to scale, but only pay for resources while I'm using them. Uh, turns out Vertex AI has components that makes it really easy to go from what we've done. And then a natural progression step is to go, hey, let's just put that over there and let it run. And when it's finished, we'll have an answer. Uh, what we're going to do is show multiple ways of doing that, different workflows for different work styles across the notebooks in this series with TensorFlow. So you're going to see A, B, C, D, E, F, or we're going to do it as a training job or a pipeline or uh, even incorporating hyperparameter tuning uh, to say like maybe the learning rate and the momentum, you know, two parameters I didn't even expose in our conversation here. Uh, maybe we want to allow those to not be default, but find the best one in a range, uh, we'll do that. And we'll show how to do that from the notebook, but launching it out as another service. Uh, and then you could even imagine, well, as a model scales and you monitor it, you need to trigger retraining it or deprecating it because it's starting to fail. But that's part of a bigger ecosystem that's also out of the notebook. So that monitoring and retraining, the ML ops side of this, as we offload, it becomes a component we can call as part of an automated process. Um, so definitely if you've enjoyed this video, you know, catalog this knowledge and let's join each other in the next video and start walking through different workflows that could be helpful for you. Uh, I wanna say thank you for sticking in with this video. I, I know it's, it's long and I tried to be as exhaustive as possible. I invite the conversation around, you know, whatever questions you have about this, we can make it better together. Uh, that's the great part about GitHub is we can even launch changes and corrections and everybody in the future will get those automatically. Um, 
If you really like this, hit like. If you want, hit subscribe, and you'll know when the next videos A, B, C, D, E, F come out. And then also the videos when we get to R and <clears throat> Scikit-Learn and PyTorch. We're going to do the exact same flows with those uh, platforms to show how they work as well. And we'll even make native choices for each of them. Uh, if you really want to engage in a conversation about this video, head over to GitHub, the repo, hit issues, start a new issue. That'll start a dialogue and we'll make this one better and all the future ones better together. Uh, and with that, I want to say thank you. Let's work together to make the practice of AI and ML more collaborative, accurate, and approachable to a wider and more well-connected audience. Have a great day.